<laughs> Tonight's speaker is uh, David Prentice. David Prentice has a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Assumption College, a master's degree in political science from Boston College, and a Juris Doctor degree from New England School of Law. David has been president and CEO of the New Bedford Symphony Orchestra since 2008. He serves on the Board of Trustees for Alma Del Mar Charter School in New Bedford, the Advisory Council of Our Sisters School, and the Advisory Board of the New Bedford Research and Robotics. He's an adjunct professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, where he teaches courses on constitutional law, American government, and political philosophy. David lives in New Bedford and has been a member of the Roundtable for many years. Uh, so as always, David, we are always honored and privileged to have you here. Uh, I want to welcome David tonight. Uh, he'll be presenting on Catton's grant, uh, Quiet Greatness. So we'll hear a little bit about Bruce Catton and Grant. So without any further ado. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Thanks for inviting me back. Uh, I always look forward to these evenings, um, and uh, I always kind of appreciate the uh, motivation they give me to kind of put my thoughts in some kind of order, hopefully, uh, and do more research and learning about uh, the Civil War and what lessons we can still pull uh, from that uh, incredible event in our history. Now, the genesis of tonight's talk is a little bit embarrassing, uh, personally, for me. Because, of course, ever since I was in high school, I knew about Bruce Catton, and I knew about his Army of the Potomac uh, trilogy. I knew about his Centennial History of the Civil War trilogy. You know, if you go to used books stores, when we used to do that, you would always see them up on the shelves. Uh, and so, so I, I knew who Bruce Catton was. Uh, but then, it might have been two summers ago, I was at the, uh, you know, the Friends Society in Westport, the huge uh, book sale they have every summer. And so I'm going through the books, and there I find, here, yeah, let me, I might as well pull it out. Uh, I find these two guys. Grant moves south. Grant Takes Command by Bruce Catton. And so here, here's my embarrassing moment. I had never realized Bruce Catton had written a, a, a study of Grant. Uh, and so when I found this, I was like, whoa. I had already kind of developed this, this real keen interest in Grant and trying to learn more about him. And then, of course, finding out that Bruce Catton had done this incredible uh, two-volume study of him, I, uh, I was just really thrilled. And so I think... Uh, at some point a little bit after that, um, uh, I was asked if I would come back and give a talk, and I thought, well, this is perfect. I'll really uh, delve into these two books and really try to understand the way Catton understood Grant, and then see what lessons we can learn from that and, and share it with the round table. So that, that's the idea for tonight. That's what we're going to do. Uh, now, by way of context, we just need a little background. Uh, you know, Ulysses Grant has been with us uh, for a long time, uh, and his reputation and his treatment by historians and in popular history has kind of gone up and down, which is very common with uh, historical figures. Uh, they have their day in the sun, then they kind of wane, and then sometimes they come back. So um, I just thought I'd do a little, you know, summary of how Grant has been viewed through the years. Uh, and of course, I think we all know during the war he had his detractors, people who said he was a drunk all the time, uh, that he was a butcher, uh, that he didn't really care about his men, uh, he was always facing inferior generals, that's why he won some battles, or maybe it was because of his subordinates uh, who really were the, the masterminds of what he did, uh, his chief of staff, John Rollins, some people suggested that Rollins was the real brains uh, behind Grant's uh, uh, generalship. Um, or some people just said he had plain good luck, and, and that's what, what uh, uh, 
allowed him to have some success. Uh, but of course, also during the war, he had many admirers and supporters, uh, the most important one, of course, being Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but even these admirers, for the most part, what they would say are things like, oh, Grant, he's highly capable. Uh, he's very persistent. You know, he doesn't give up. Uh, and, and therefore, that is what they saw as the key to his success. But very seldom do you see the word great used. In fact, sometimes you even see the word great used as in he wasn't a great general, but he was definitely the right man for the job, or he, would def he definitely had what it takes to succeed. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, I always kind of found that fascinating. And uh, lo and behold, Bruce Catton kind of found that fascinating too. Uh, after Grant's death in 1885 and the publication of his memoirs, um, he did have a little bit of a resurgence of interest and appreciation for what he did. Um, uh, but then he kind of fell out of, uh, out of the um, picture. In the 1900s, there were a few military historians who really came to appreciate his accomplishments, and, and a few of them wrote some, some really great books about, about Grant's uh, accomplishments. But then that kind of died away. And in the 1930s, his reputation actually started to go down, especially in comparison to Robert E. Lee. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is uh, Douglas Southall Freeman's you know, famous uh, writings about Lee and Lee's lieutenants and all of that. And, and actually, even through World War II, uh, uh, if you asked most American generals you know, who they would look to as a model, Lee would always come out, and, and Grant, not so much. Um, and so, uh, so this was interesting. And of course, by the time we get after World War II, uh, Canton actually was too old to serve in World War II, so he worked uh, for the War Production Board um, in Washington. Uh, and, and so he kind of saw this firsthand. And so in the 1950s, he got it in his head to say, you know, I really want to delve into Grant. I really want to answer this question. Was Grant a great general? or just like, you know, a, a really good general. Um, and uh, as he went into this work, what he found is that one, he, he did conclude that, that in his opinion, at least Grant was a great general, and so he wanted to correct that record, but he faced a big challenge. And that challenge was Grant himself. And so now let me explain what I mean by that. So this is how Grant, this is how Catton begins his, his, uh, his first volume on Grant. This is describing Grant in June of 1861. He was a colonel, you know, he had tried to get back into the regular army and they said, no thanks. Uh, and, and finally he was appointed by the governor of Illinois uh, uh, as a colonel of volunteers. And, and this is what the governor of Illinois remembered uh, about Grant. He was plain, very plain. And men said that he usually went about camp in a short blue coat and an old slouch hat, wearing nothing that indicated his rank, nothing indeed that even proved he was in the army. The men of his regiment spoke, spoke of him as the quiet man, and afterward they admitted that they never exactly understood him. He was not in the least impressive, but somehow he took charge, subdue, subduing the disobedient without apparently using anything more than a hard look and a soft word. An admiring chaplain, looking back at the end of the war, said that no stranger seeing, seeing this man in a crowd would ever be moved to ask who he was. And this is how Canton sums up this introduction. There was nothing about Ulysses S. Grant that struck the eye, and this puzzled people after it was all over, because it seemed reasonable that greatness somewhere along the line should look like greatness. Grant could never look like anything, and he could never make the things he did look very special. And afterward, men could remember nothing more than the fact that when he came around, things seemed to happen. So it was Grant himself, I think, what Catton is telling us, that is the obstacle for people really appreciating his greatness. Uh, he was quiet. He was matter of fact. He didn't believe in flourishes. He didn't put on a show. That just wasn't who he was. Um, in fact, 
the way Canton presents Grant is that, first of all, with respect to K Grant's character, he thought self-promotion and self-importance was wrong. Grant would say, nobody should be promoting themselves. You should just do your job, and if you do it right, other people will notice. But you shouldn't be putting yourself forward for promotions or, or for uh, um, uh, praise or anything like that. So that was deeply embedded in Grant's character. Second, his personality and his style was kind of quiet. I mean, sometimes that's exaggerated, that he like never spoke when people were around. That, that's not true at all. He was very friendly and he really liked conversation when he was with people he knew. But when he was with people he didn't know, then he would clam up, he would be quiet, especially around ladies. He said he was always afraid of saying something wrong when ladies were present, so he would try not to say anything uh, in that case. Um, so there's his personality and style that just really kind of made him e either a quiet or sort of a soft-spoken person. And then finally, I think what Catton shows us is Grant's method. Uh, he recognized that what kept a lot of people from being successful is that they get, they get caught up in distractions. Um, uh, or they impose obstacles on themselves. One, one of his famous comments is, uh, you know, he was, he, he was famous for never swearing. In fact, pretty much nobody has documented any swearing by Grant during the war. Um, and somebody once asked him, you know, don't you ever get angry? You know, why don't you swear? And Grant said, well, you know, at a pretty early age, I saw people would get angry, and usually when they were angry, they ended up doing some pretty stupid things. They did things that would actually harm what they really wanted to do. And so I realized, well, if I really you know, want to avoid doing stupid things or, or, or making mistakes, then I should not become angry. <laughs> so, so in other words, anger is a distraction, right? Anger takes you off your focus. Um, and uh, self-imposed obstacles, self-promotion. If you're so busy trying to promote yourself, or if you're so busy acting important, that is really imposing an obstacle, Grant would think, on really being successful. So, so I think he very consciously chose this method, which of course also matched his temperament. In a way, you could say he was making a virtue out of necessity, right? He was certainly having this temperament and disposition, but he also caught got to see the, the benefit of it and the fact that it would allow him to be really focused on the substance, the job, the work that he had to do. Um, and so because of that, what Catton is telling us right at the beginning of his study is that if we want to find, if we want to see Grant's uh, greatness, we're going to have to look very closely and very carefully. It's not going to jump out at us. We have to look for it. Um, and so I think that's what Catton does. For the rest of these two volumes, he really lays out all the evidence, all the information we need so that we can see, and I'm sure he would hope that we would agree with him, that when you really study Grant closely, there is the greatness uh, that really uh, was the reason for his success. So how are we going to look closely and carefully at, at Grant? We're going to look at three areas that Catton emphasizes. One is the battlefield tactics and the campaign strategies that Grant developed. Second is Grant's strategy, right? The big picture of the, of the whole war. And the third is the command skills and qualities that are necessary to, to be successful as a general. Uh, and so let's go through each one. Grant's battlefield tactics and campaign strategy. This is what we learn when we read Canton's descriptions of Fort Donelson, Shiloh, Vicksburg, Chattanooga, and the Virginia campaign. Let's start with Fort Donelson. Uh, of course, these are not going to be in-depth descriptions or analysis of the battles uh, because we don't have enough time for that. Catton does that in his book, uh, but I'm just going to kind of summarize some of the key points. I'm, I'm sure you are all basically familiar with, with Fort Donelson. Grant goes up 
and, and, and takes uh, Fort Henry very easily, right? Uh, and then he marches over 12 miles to get to Fort Donaldson. He sets up his troops around uh, Fort Donaldson. Uh, they have um, the gunboats uh, fire on Fort Donaldson, hoping that the fort would surrender. The fort doesn't surrender. Fort Donaldson is much better positioned and is able to withstand the bombardment of the gunboats. So Grant realizes, okay, we're gonna have to attack. Well, before he was ready to attack, he was off uh, visiting the gunboats away from the troop line, and of course what happens is the Confederates attack, right? They try to break out and escape because they know what's gonna happen if they stick around. And it goes very badly for uh, the Union troops to begin with, uh, mainly uh, McClellan's. McClellan is up here, and he gets pushed all the way back here, and this is where McClellan ends up. He starts the morning here, and then in the afternoon, he ends up back here. And this panic, everybody is saying, we have to retreat, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be destroyed. And of course, word gets to Grant, uh, he's at the gunboat, he gets on his horse and flies to the scene. And as soon as he gets there, he says, gentlemen, the position on the right must be retaken. And he says to an aide, some of our men are pretty badly, badly demoralized. But the enemy must be more so, for he was attempting to force his way out, but has fallen back. The one who attacks first now will be victorious, and the enemy will have to be in a hurry if he gets ahead of me. All right, so Grant was gonna move fast. Uh, and, and so that one quote tells you, you know, all you need to know about Grant's understanding of battle psychology, right? He was really a psychologist of war, I think, because he knew what people were thinking. He knew what his troops were thinking. He had a pretty good idea of what the uh, enemy's troops and the, other, and the enemy commanders were thinking. And he realized that at a critical point in a battle, it's really a question of who attacks first at the next moment that is going to decide the battle. So that's the decision he makes. But of course, just making the decision isn't gonna guarantee you success. You have to skillfully manage your troops in that counterattack to be successful, and that's exactly what Grant does. He orders Wallace's troops up to lead the counterattack because they hadn't been uh, uh, much um, uh, subjected to any of the battle earlier. Uh, McClellan, he, he puts in the rear to regroup and then to be ready to support Wallace, to be this, the reinforcements for Wallace. So that gives uh, McClellan's troops time to get reorganized and to recover. He brings up the gunboats and says, just start firing, because that'll make the rebels nervous. Right? It's not going to really do much good physically, but psychologically, they're going to feel you know, the gunboats coming again. And then finally, he says, well, if the uh, rebels just tried to escape on their left flank and brought all their troops over, then that means th their right flank must be weak. They most likely brought troops away from the right flank to uh, support the attack on the left flank. So he says, what we're going to do? We're going to attack their right flank. And so he calls up C.F. Smith and orders him to attack the right flank while Wallace is coming in um, on the left flank uh, of the rebels. And of course, we all know what happens. Uh, Fort Donaldson surrenders unconditionally, uh, and Grant captures his first army, right? He captured an army at Fort Donaldson, and he went on, of course, to capture two other armies, right? So he's the only general that captured three armies during the Civil War, uh, at Donaldson, at Vicksburg, and then, of course, at Appomattox. Um, so, uh, that's a first example that Canton gives us of the mastery that Grant had during a battle. Um, and, and something Canton points out is that Grant nearly always visited the heaviest fighting. Uh, wherever the heaviest fighting was taking place, he wanted to go. And of course, his aides would say, General, you know, you're exposing yourself to danger. You know, that's not a good idea. And he would say back to them, I have to see and know what's going on. 
He was very hands-on. There's other uh, great examples of that. After Chattanooga, um, Longstreet was in eastern Tennessee, and Grant really wanted to get Longstreet out of eastern Tennessee. The reason, Grant said, is that as long as Longstreet is in eastern Tennessee, what I do is dictated by him being there. If I can get him out of east Tennessee, then I can fight the battles that I want to fight. And this, of course, is always a, a major aspect of military strategy. You want to fight at the place and time of your own choosing, not the enemy's choosing, right? Lee always wanted to do that. Grant always wanted to do that. Um, so he went to eastern Tennessee, and his, uh, his aides had said, we don't think we can really get Longstreet out of there. Grant said, well, I'm going to see for myself. He went, and he said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> we can't get Longstreet out of there, so we need to make other plans. Um, another example of this is in the um, investigation of the mine at, Saint, at Petersburg, uh, the failure of the mine attack. Uh, Grant was called to testify. And, uh, and they asked him, you know, what would you have done, you know, or what would have been necessary um, for the mine attack to be successful? And, and the way Grant put it is that, well, if I was the, the division commander in charge of the mine attack, I would have been there. <laughs> all right, because we all know that the division commander was off drinking, right, in, in some, uh, in some uh, protected area. And Grant said, you, the commander had to be on the scene to see what was happening and then to direct his troops to deal with what was happening. And so that was certainly a bedrock principle uh, that Grant understood, that for a commander to make the right decisions, they need to see for themselves what's going on. They need to have the right information. Um, and so that's what he did at Shiloh. Uh, uh, he went up to uh, General uh, Benjamin Prentiss at, at, at what came to be called the Hornet's Nest, and he said, you have to hold this spot at all hazards. Because Grant knew that if that spot went, then the whole army would be overrun. And, and Prentiss did that. He held out for six hours before being surrounded and having to surrender. But uh, what Catton basically says is that the fact that uh, that Prentice's troops were able to stay, even though they were being decimated, really slowed down the Confederate advance and gave Grant enough time to deal with everything else. And at Shiloh, that's what Grant did. He rode across the battlefield all afternoon, regrouping uh, troops, placing them at the right spot. Uh, one of the most important things he did is he brought a battery up uh, to a certain place so that it would protect the landing, Pittsburgh landing on the river, so that the Confederates couldn't take the landing, because of course if they had taken the landing, the whole thing would have been up. And then uh, uh, the most famous thing, of course, that uh, Grant did at Shiloh is at the end of the day when pretty much everybody thought they were going to retreat, he said, no, we're going to attack in the morning. And they did, and they forced the Confederates uh, from, from the field. Uh, Canton calls Shiloh a negative victory, in that it's not so much that, that the Union won, but the Confederates lost. That the Confederates had to win Shiloh to regain that upper pot of, of, uh, of the region that they had lost because of Henry and Donaldson. Um, and the fact that they did not succeed was really the victory that, uh, that Grant achieved at Shiloh. Uh, I won't get too far into Vicksburg because hopefully some of you were in attendance at my Vicksburg talk that went on and on for a long time because there's a lot going on in Vicksburg. But, but just the highlights that Canton points out is that the boldness of Grant's uh, campaign to go down the river behind enemy lines to be cut off by his supplies and to face an army that was larger than his. When Grant first landed uh, uh, south of Vicksburg, the Confederates had more troops than him. Eventually, he brought in more troops, but for those first three to four weeks, he was outnumbered. And what did he do? He orchestrated five different battles in which, in every individual battle, he had higher numbers than the Confederates. He kept them guessing. He kept them off balance. They were constantly reacting to his initiative. So he was choosing the place and time of his battles, and of course, he won all five of those battles. And in every one of those battles, Catton describes, Grant was on the field. He was directing troops. And of course, the way he'd do it, he'd go up to a, a regimental commander and he says, you know, I think a battery over there by that hill would, would probably help us. <laughs> and that's what he would do. And then the, the commander would say, OK, get that battery over there. Um, and so, uh, so Vicksburg uh, is really, in, in some ways, uh, 
uh, Grant's masterpiece as far as the complexity, the boldness uh, of, of his campaign. You know, I think one of the reasons that Lee you know, has such a, 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 a strong reputation, which he certainly deserves, is because of his boldness, right? Splitting his army in half, invading the North, that boldness is something people can see and that people can say, oh, that's greatness. Um, uh, with Grant, uh, because everything else that was going on, it took them so long to finally get below Vicksburg, um, uh, and then of course they, they did have to do a siege eventually. Maybe it took a little shine off of that, and people don't appreciate just how risky and how bold that campaign strategy was. Uh, uh, the thing that Chattanooga teaches us uh, is that you can have a great original plan, right? Sherman on the left, Thomas in the middle, Hooker up uh, on the right. Um, and you had this whole thing set. Sherman was going to stop the attack, push the Confederates back, and then uh, Hooker and, and Thomas would come in. Well, the, the way I would describe Chattanooga uh, from Grant's perspective, because what we know, of course, is that Sherman ended up in the wrong spot. It was very confusing. They didn't have good maps. And he thought he was at the place where on the other side of the hill the uh, Confederates were. And when he went over the hill, there were no Confederates. And that's because Sherman was on the wrong hill. <laughs> All right? uh, uh, but in a way, you could say what Grant's philosophy was at Chattanooga was no Sherman, no problem because he immediately improvised, changed his plans. The whole thing was set up to have flexibility to begin with, um, but he ordered Thomas to go ahead, take the rifle pits. We all, of course, know the soldiers took the rifle pits and then some, and they, they charged right up, up uh, Missionary Ridge um, and, and took, uh, took the high ground. Hooker came down uh, from the right flank, and of course, uh, the Battle of Chattanooga was won. Uh, so, so, I mean, when you think about it, sometimes to appreciate what somebody has done is you have to think about what they didn't do, uh, what others might have done. So a lot of generals, if Sherman had ended up being in the wrong place, a lot of generals would have said, oh, all right, Everybody, let's regroup. We have to start over. Let's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll attack next week instead or something like that, right? Um, uh, not Grant. He was like, no, we, I can still make this work. His, his ability to improvise, but to like know he was going to improvise. I mean, he knew that improvisation was an essential part of success as a general, especially in the context of the Civil War, which I'll, I'll get back to a little bit later. Um, and then we have the Virginia campaign. Uh, and of course, we could spend many hours talking about the Virginia campaign, but just a couple things. Uh, one thing that Canton points out is that in the summer of, of 64, the, the troop numbers weren't that different. Uh, uh, at, at, at one point, at the lowest point for, for Grant, uh, the Army of the Potomac had 46,000 troops, which was only a few thousand more than what Lee had. And of course, Lee was in trenches uh, on the defensive, right? Uh, so tactically, Grant did not really have a huge uh, advantage. Now, of course, from a strategic standpoint, he knew he was getting more, right? So that is, is certainly a, a huge advantage. But as far as the tactical situation of Grant versus Lee, so to speak, during the Virginia campaign, for most of that campaign, they were pretty evenly matched in numbers. And of course, Lee was on the defensive in trenches, for the mo in trenches for the most part, uh, which, uh, as we all know, means that you don't need to have as many troops as the ones that, that are attacking you. Uh, uh, so here's something that Grant says to Halleck in June of 1864. This is actually uh, right after Cold Harbor. So they've been battling it out for 30 days, incredible losses on both sides. Uh, um, uh, and, and so Grant writes a, a letter to Halleck saying, well, we've been at this for 30 days, and this is what I've learned about the enemy. So it shows you that Grant was always thinking about what do I need to know to, to eventually be successful. And what he says is, what I've learned about the enemy is that their highest priority is to not lose, to not risk any major engagement. They are either staying in the entrenchment, or if they come out, they come out very limited, and they're always ready to fall back if things don't go well for them. So in other words, Lee was not going to offer Grant any major decisive battle. 
Now, of course, Grant was kind of hoping Lee would, because Grant was very confident that he could beat Lee in an open battle. Uh, and of course, that would end the war sooner, uh, assuming Grant won. Um, uh, but Lee wasn't going to do that. So Grant gave him the chance to do that. Basically, Grant gave Lee a chance to make a mistake. And Lee didn't, because of course Lee was a pretty good general too, so he did not make too many mistakes. Um, and so then Grant continues, therefore, based on what we now know about the enemy's strategy, I have to develop a new plan. And the new plan is we're going to go south of the James River. All right? And that is one of the most brilliant movements that any army has ever done, where they disengaged directly in front of Lee's army and got south of the James. And from a strategic standpoint, Grant always knew that there was a good chance that they would have to end up going south of the James. Um, if, unless Lee offered this you know, decisive battle opportunity, he knew he would have to get to James. And in a way, the south of the James was like the strategic hinge of the whole war. Because from the south of the James, Grant could eventually cut off Lee from all the rest of the south. But also, if Lee was going to abandon Richmond and try to reinforce Johnston against Sherman, being south of the James would allow Grant to cut off, or at least, as, as Grant said, um, if, if Lee heads south, I'll be ready to annoy him. <laughs> That's the way he put it. Um, and so, uh, so Grant was ready for all of these contingencies, thinking about what might Lee do here, what might Lee do there, and he was always telling his commanders, be ready, be ready, because Lee might do this, Lee might do that, and if so, this is what we're going to do. Um, so of course, as we all know, Grant did get to the south uh, of the James, and then it was only a matter of time uh, uh, before things happened uh, the way they did. Um, uh, here's a great uh, anecdote. Uh, in July of 1864, when Early was causing all that trouble up in the Shenandoah, uh, Grant goes up to take a look, and, uh, and the commander there says, we don't know where Early is. We, you know, he's out there someplace, and we don't know, so I'm going to send out you know, scouts and cavalry to try to find out where Early is. And Grant says, no, 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 don't do that. Advance your army to this town, because as soon as you advance your army to this town, Early will end up in either of these other towns to face you or to try to cut you off. And that's how we'll find where Early is. We'll make him show up. And it worked. They advanced the army. Early showed up just where Grant thought he was going to show up. Um, uh, it still took a little while, obviously, for us to finally get Shenandoah straightened out, but that was a, an important part at the, at the beginning of it. Uh, in February of 1865, uh, Grant said to Sheridan, uh, these are like the five different things that might happen, and I need you to be ready to do this in the case of, of each one. Um, it, again, just shows Grant's capacity to imagine the different possibilities and then to always have a really good plan uh, to deal with that. In March of 65, 1865, um, Grant said to his commanders, if the rebels attack anywhere, you are to attack the line in front of you immediately without orders. You do not have to come to me for an order to attack. Because, he said, if Lee is going to attack any one place on our line, he's going to have to pull troops from other places. And so if... Um, if he attacks on, the, on, on our left flank, I want everybody in the center and everybody on the right to immediately attack in front of them. Don't wait for my orders. And of course, for the Army of the Potomac, this was kind of like a mind-blowing thing. And, and I, we'll get into that a little bit more about what was going on with the Army of the Potomac, according to Catton. But this idea that your commanding general would just kind of give you a blank check. If this circumstance happens, you are automatically to attack. Because Grant always appreciated the need for speed, the need to get there fast to really uh, uh, be successful and to reduce casualties. He was always concerned about uh, tr uh, trying to reduce casualties by maneuver and by uh, um, moving fast. Uh, of course, he was also willing to take losses when, when, uh, when he thought they were unavoidable and necessary. Uh, by uh, 1865, Grant uh, uh, said to his uh, commanders, I'm getting Lee in a position where he must lose a great portion of his troops. So he basically, this was a chess match between Lee and Grant. And Grant felt that he had gotten to the point now that no matter what Lee did, 
Like Grant knew what the options were for Lee to do. And whatever he did, he was going to lose a big portion of his army. Um, and then finally, uh, I think this kind of captures uh, for Canton uh, the essence of the way Grant thought about battlefield tactics and campaign strategy. He said to Sheridan at Five Forks, get in the rear of Lee's right flank, and then we'll see what can be done. <laughs> All right? So it's like, we don't have the full plan. We have the first step of the plan. You get in the rear of Lee's flank, and then we'll figure out what, what we can do. Grant had this incredible confidence that in any situation, I can figure out what we have to do to prevail. And, uh, and actually, I think he, he kind of used that in, 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 a, in a way to, to really to be uh, especially effective. Um, uh, but before we get into that, while all of this was going on, I just gave you everything from Grant's perspective, right? Canton gave us everything from Grant's perspective. But then what Canton does, which I think is really very effective, is he says, well, let's see what Lee was thinking during this campaign, all right? And so he gives us many examples of what Lee's perspective was during the Virginia campaign. So in early June of 1864, Lee said, we must defeat Grant before he gets to the James River. So Lee knew, Lee was as smart as Grant, I think, in, in many ways. He knew that that south of the James was the hinge, and that if Grant got to the south of the James, eventually it was only a matter of time uh, before Lee uh, knew that the Confederacy would be uh, uh, defeated. Uh, in late June of 64, Lee says, Grant has not done what I was hoping he would do. <laughs> I think that's a great line. In other words, he was hoping Grant was going to make a mistake, just like Grant was hoping Lee was going to make a mistake, right? And Grant did not make mistakes. He kept his troops exactly where they had to be positioned so that he was always ready to um, uh, achieve a victory, and most importantly, until that happened, to avoid a defeat. And so, we you know, we could get into the details of Cold Harbor and the wilderness and all of that. And of course, they were awful battles and lots of men died uh, and, and were wounded. Um, uh, but the point that Catton is making um, is that it was all serving a strategic purpose. Grant had a strategic purpose in doing what he did in all those battles. He thought that those battles were worth it because they were serving the ultimate strategic uh, plan that, uh, that he had. Uh, and uh, in January of 65, Lee said, by, protect by protecting Richmond, I have, to, I have had to permit the enemy to make my plans for me. So this is the same thing that Grant said about Longstreet, right? Mm -hmm. As long as Longstreet is in eastern Tennessee, he decides what I do, right? And of course, that's what a good general does. A good general takes the initiative and knows the positioning of, of, of his army so that the other side has to react to you rather than you reacting to them. So of course, what Lee always wanted to do was to engage in a battle at uh, the place and time of his choosing. Grant was not allowing Lee to do that because Grant knew that Lee was being required to protect Richmond, up to a certain point, obviously, uh, and then they abandoned Richmond. Uh, but as long as uh, Lee had to um, protect Richmond, Grant used it against him, right? Just like Lee would have used it against Grant if Grant had been in that situation. And then finally, Canton says, by the spring of 1865, Grant's grip on Lee's right and left flank was so strong that there was no way Lee could uh, conduct an orderly retreat. There was no way he could get away clean like he did every place else, right? Gettysburg, Antietam, all the other places Lee was able to uh, uh, retreat. Grant made sure that uh, Lee wasn't going to be able to retreat this last time. Of course, he was very anxious about it. He, Grant, you could, in, in his correspondence and in his uh, remarks, he was, he was, in a way, you could almost say paranoid that Lee would escape one more time. Lincoln was too, because of course Lee had done it so many times. And so everything Grant did it, as he was trying to draw Lee out or trying to cut off his supplies, he always would say, whatever we do, we just have to make sure that we're ready in case Lee 
makes a break for it, because we're not going to let him escape this time. And so everything Grant did was to make sure that this last time, Lee would not be able to escape. And of course, at Appomattox, that's what happened, right? Lee tried to escape, and he couldn't. All right, so I kind of want to sum up this, um, this approach that Catton has of uh, Grant's battlefield tactics and campaign strategy. Um, and, and this is something Catton says about the Battle of Belmont, which of course was very early, very small battle, but, but Catton thinks it's very revealing of, of, um, of Grant's uh, greatness. Uh, Catton says that at the Battle of Bel Belmont, one of, the most, uh, one of the deeply rooted impulses that would characterize Grant as a soldier had already become visible. The impulse to get to close quarters with his antagonists and slug it out. Now, I think that's true. Grant wanted to get in there, just like he said to uh, Sheridan, get in, in Lee's uh, rear, and then we'll see what we can do, right? We'll slug it out. But in some ways, I don't think Canton does full justice to what Grant was really doing. Um, slugging, again, kind of sounds like this just war of attrition, just you know, battling it out with this, without really thinking about the tactics and the strategy. The way that I would phrase it, based on everything that Canton tells us about how Grant managed battles and campaigns, what I would say is that Grant figured out that there is this fundamental uncertainty and contingency in war. You just don't know everything that's happening. You don't know what's going to happen. And, and so therefore, you always are going to have unexpected things to deal with. Now, most generals say, yeah, and that's what, you know, that's what causes failure. So the way to deal with that, most generals would say, is, well, we have to have a really good plan. We have to think of everything and just have a plan, and we stick with the plan. And then if things change so the plan doesn't work, then we fall back, we regroup, and we plan for another day, right? That's what most of the Union generals were doing, right, for the first couple years of the war. Grant said, no, that's exactly what we want to happen. I think what Grant wanted was to create the unexpected on both sides, because he knew he couldn't control what was going to happen fully. But he knew that on the spot, he would be able to figure out a way to turn that to his advantage. That's what he did at Donaldson. He did it at Shiloh. Uh, he did it during the battles of the Vicksburg campaign. He did it at Chattanooga. And basically, that's what he did at Virginia, in, in the Virginia campaign, too. He wanted to force the enemy into that area of uncertainty and contingency, because Grant always had the confidence that he would be able to figure out first how to turn that um, to his advantage. Um, and I think, in a way, that's his genius as a general. I mean, his, his, his campaign strategies were all excellent. His battlefield plans were all excellent. But really what made the difference was that in the heat of battle, which he welcomed, he knew that's where his strength was, and that's where he could outfight the other general. Um, so that is kind of my sense of what uh, uh, Canton brings us to as far as Grant's uh, greatness when it comes to battlefield tactics and strategy. And then I, admittedly, I'm adding on a little bit more in, in my own opinion about what Grant was really, uh, really up to and, and really what was the, the, great, uh, the great key to his success. I mean, he, he just had success. He captured three armies. He defeated the Confederacy, the whole Confederacy. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think that really is something that, that deserves more uh, appreciation. OK, now let's shift to Grant on grand strategy. And the way Catton um, covers this is he goes back to those early years. This is the summer of 1861. Um, Grant was stuck in Missouri, right? This was before, uh, do we pronounce it Cairo or Cairo in Illinois? Does anybody know? Cairo. Cairo, yeah. So this was before Cairo, right? He was um, just a, a brigadier general in charge of a couple regiments. And uh, he was sent down to Ironton, Missouri. Um, and uh, when he was there, he sent a proposal to Fremont, who was in charge of the West, uh, with this kind of general uh, 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 strategy to 
bring the war to the South, which Fremont ignored. Uh, also at that time, um, Grant had a visitor, a fellow named John Emerson, who recounted this, um, that he visited Grant one day, and Grant was sitting at a table with a large map of the Mississippi Valley, the upper uh, uh, valley, uh, Tennessee, Cumberland Rivers, and, he, and Grant had made these red pencil marks, basically uh, going, you know, uh, up the Tennessee and the Cumberland, and then coming down the Mississippi to Vicksburg. And, and so what Emerson you know, was claiming is that in the summer of 61, Grant was trying to figure out how do we defeat the South. Uh, and he was just a brigadier in charge of a couple of regiments at that time. But the way his brain was, he couldn't help but think about the grand strategy um, that was uh, necessary to eventually win the war. Um, also, here are just kind of some, let's call them sound bites of, uh, of Grant. Uh, something Grant said at Cairo, the objective is not to make armies retreat, but to destroy or capture them. Now, that makes a lot of sense to me, right? <laughs> and I'm no general. But we know Halleck was always talking about making the rebels retreat back to the south. Um, Meade, after Gettysburg, said, right, you know, we've, we've expelled the invader, uh, you know, from our country. Uh, and Lincoln would get so frustrated, because Lincoln understood this too. The point isn't to make the rebels retreat. <laughs> the point is to either capture them or to destroy their armies, to destroy their ability to make war. Grant understood that right from the beginning. In 1861, he, he knew that. Uh, and now here's a question. What happened immediately after the victories at Fort Donelson, Shiloh, Vicksburg, and Chattanooga? The answer, nothing happened. Nothing happened. After each of those victories, Grant would make a plan to do something immediately next, and he would send it to Halleck, and Halleck would say, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that, or not yet, not, you know, it's too soon. And, and so again, there was this inability by uh, Halleck, by um, McKellen and others, not to see the big picture, the need to constantly be on the move, constantly bringing pressure onto the Confederate uh, troops. Grant got so frustrated at that, and of course, finally, as general-in-chief, he had the power to, to make that happen. But he understood right from 1861 that that's what the army had to be doing. Uh, in his memoirs, he says, after Shiloh, I realized that a decisive battle would not win the war, only the complete conquest of the South would. And again, a lot of generals and a lot of politicians were still thinking, it's that one decisive battle. That's all we need to win this war. Grant knew after Shiloh that wasn't going to happen. And so he, he, he makes this phrase, complete conquest of the South. And so of course, once you realize that's what you have to do, then the next thing is, well, you have to figure out how to do it. Right? And this is hard, right? I mean, in, in judging Grant's generalship, we have to factor in the degree of difficulty of what he had to do. And, and one way to look at this, and of course this can turn into a bigger debate, is um, you know, all the South had to do to win was to not lose, right? In one way, if the South had not lo lost for four years, then in 64, Lincoln would have been voted out and the war would have been over, right? So in a way, you could argue, I know it's more complicated than this, but you could argue that the best strategy for the South to have followed was let's just not lose for four years, right? We don't have to win, we just have to avoid losing. Grant, the North, they had to win. And they had to win over an incredibly large geographic area that had mountains and rivers and impassable wetlands. And so the idea of, co of co the complete conquest of the South is a huge, huge challenge. The degree of difficulty of what Grant and the North had to do you know, is just incredible. Now, of course, we had more troops, we had more industry, so we had all of those advantages, but you could say, thank God, because our task was about 100 times harder than the South's task, when you look at it from a military strategic uh, perspective. Um, 
And so when Grant finally was made general in chief in 1864, this is what he said. He said, the Union armies had been like a balky team with no two horses pulling at the same time, right? And that's a great way to describe, you know, Halleck and McClellan and all the generals up until Grant, you know, getting uh, uh, general in chief. They all were kind of off doing this and doing that. L Lincoln, again, Lincoln saw this early on. He begged Halleck, he begged the generals, you have to come up with a unified plan so that we can defeat the South. And they would just kind of go off on this and this and this and not really pull it together. So of course, Grant understood this too, and that's why as soon as he became general in chief, he sent a map to Sherman, right, who was down you know, in the south, and uh, he outlined this idea of coordinated and constant pressure on all of the southern armies at the same time. And Grant's reply, and Sherman's reply was, that map to me contains more information than a volume of printed matter. From that map, I see all. Concurrent action is the thing. So the light bulb goes off in Sherman's head that Grant put there, that we need to coordinate and have a strategy where all our armies, all our superior force and materials are being used in the right way. Because all of those materials and all of those troops aren't worth that much if you're not using them in the right way, especially to accomplish this task, which is so difficult to conquer this whole very difficult, uh, challenging area. And so that's what Grant did. Uh, his aim in 1864, as Canton puts it, is to pin Lee down and make him fight the kind of war he could not win. And then, of course, be ready for every contingency. Um, by the end of 64, Sherman would move north through the Carolinas. Thomas was guarding against Lee moving south. Uh, uh, Canby was uh, ready uh, to take Mobile. Of course, uh, the Navy did that for us. Uh, but then Grant was going to have Canby come up uh, north through Alabama. And then Wilson, uh, that Canton describes as having the, the, the most powerful, effective cavalry ever seen uh, in the world at that point. Um, Wilson was going to slice west to east across Mississippi and Alabama. And so basically, the South's head would just be spinning around on a post because the North would be hitting them from every, um, every direction. Uh, all right, so this is the way Canton describes Grant as general in chief. The 1864 Virginia campaign was not merely or even essentially a war of attrition. Grant was winning the war in the Deep South and, among other things, was keeping Lee pinned down and so unable to send aid to Joe Johnston. The Virginia campaign only makes sense when viewed as part of the total picture of the strategic situation of the Union and Confederate armies. Grant forced Lee and all the Confederate armies to fight the kind of war they could not win. And that wasn't the result of big numbers or more materials, it was the result of strategy. Now, of course, you needed the numbers to do that because the, dif the task was so difficult, so big. But again, without that right strategy, all the men and all the materials in the world would not have mattered. In a way, the North proved that, right, for the first three years of the war, right, that those things did not give automatic uh, advantage. All right, final topic. Catton on Grant's command skills and qualities. From Colonel of the 21st Illinois Regiment to General in Chief. What a trajectory, huh? And again, what I really like about Canton is he starts early with Grant and he really gives us the insight and the information to appreciate the qualities that Grant had right from the beginning and to see how they then applied as the war progressed and as Grant went up and up um, in command. So, Here's Grant taking command of the 21st Illinois Regiment. Bunch of volunteers, notorious for not obeying orders, for being drunk, for, for abandoning their posts. It was a total mess. 
and Grant uh, was put in charge of them. Uh, and this is how Grant described it in his memoirs. I found it very hard work for a few days to bring all the men into anything like subordination, but the great majority favored discipline, and by the application of a little regular army punishment, all were reduced to as good discipline as one could ask. All right, so that's how Grant chose to describe it. Does anything in there sound great? Does that sound like a great man? No, it doesn't, right? And so this is what Canton says. Actually, it was not quite that simple. Grant had the regular army way of doing things at his fingertips, but he was always aware that the volunteer soldier was not the regular, and he never treated volunteers as regular recruits were commonly treated. He would impose discipline, to be sure, but it would not be the discipline of the Prussian guards. He would act always as if these raw soldiers were men who could be reasoned with, men with a sense of responsibility that would respond if anyone bothered to appeal to it. So in other words, what Canton is saying is that Grant knew how to mix, because he, he didn't just totally rely on persuasion, because sadly, right, not 100% of human beings are subject to persuasion, but Grant knew that the majority of men would respond to persuasion and reason and good leadership, and therefore he only really had to do the discipline on the hard cases. And so Grant had this ability to kind of just figure out exactly what the situation called for to make it be effective and a success. And so this is how it went. Grant's first order to the regiment. In accepting this command, your commander will require the cooperation of all the commissioned and non-commissioned officers in instructing the command and in maintaining the discipline, and he hopes to receive also the hearty support of every enlisted man. So he's really kind of appealing to their better nature, right? It's like, all right, guys, I know that you know if you're given proper direction, you will respond well and will have the kind of unit cohesion and subordination that is necessary in the military. All right, so that's how things started. Three days later, he issued this order. The following is published for the benefit of this command. It is with regret that the commanding officer learns that a number of men composing the guard of last night deserted their posts. They went off drinking in town. Uh, this is an offense against all military rule and law. In time of war, the punishment of this is death. The colonel commanding, believing that the men of his command, now in confinement for this offense, were ignorant of the magnitude of it, is not disposed to visit them with all the rigor of the law, but would admonish them and the whole command against a repetition of the offense, as it will not be excused again in the regiment." So again, I, I just think Grant, I mean, he had it. Like, he was basically saying, I'm going to give these guys one more chance. In other words, I'm not going to execute them, all right? But if they do it again, I am going to execute them. And he's, you know, he's going to say, okay, maybe they didn't really appreciate the seriousness of what they were doing. And so I, I would think that after getting this order, he got everybody's attention. Not by yelling, not by putting on a big show, just by kind of being calm and intelligent, but also being like, very savvy, like he wasn't naive. He had that threat of execution in there, right? But he led with kind of a more welcoming way to which he assumed and was right that almost all the men would respond to. Uh, so this approach that he took as a colonel over a regiment of volunteers in 1861, that's exactly what he did in the West as he moved up and, and, and led uh, the Army of the West. He would take the measure of his commanders, and then when he found that they were up to the task, he would empower them. And, and one example of this actually happens later with Sheridan, um, uh, to clear out the Shenandoah Valley, right? It was having a tough time. So uh, Grant goes up to, to meet with Sh uh, Sh uh, Sheridan, and Grant had a plan all worked out to clear the Shenandoah Valley. So he walks in, he says, Sheridan, how's it going? We gotta get this you know, valley cleared out. And Sheridan says, yes, General, I agree. Here's my plan. And Sheridan put out this whole plan that he had come up with. Uh, Grant's plan, he never took it out of his pocket. He looked over at Sheridan's plan, he said, that's a good plan, go ahead. So he didn't even let Sheridan know that he had 
developed his own plan. He empowered Sheridan. He knew that Sheridan, following his own plan, assuming it was a good one, which Grant thought it was, was going to be the best way to make that commander successful. Um, also, Grant would always give credit. At a Chatt after Chattanooga, everybody said, Grant saved the day. Grant wrote his report to Halleck and Stanton. No, it was, it was Thomas and, uh, um, and his, his staff. They came up with the plan to resupply Chattanooga, and they made it happen. And so they are the ones that should get the credit. Uh, uh, with Sherman and McPherson, when, when Grant um, uh, was appointed general in chief. He wrote a letter to Sherman, and then he said, I'm going to write the same letter to McPherson. And basically, he says, You know, you know better than anybody that the success that people think I have had is in large part because of your work. And so he just, without any hesitation, gave Sherman and McPherson all the credit that they deserved for his own success. Um, and of course, there's also that famous exchange of letters. You know, after Atlanta, there was this little Sherman boomlet. You know, Grant was kind of bogged down, people thought, in Virginia. And so some people were saying, hey, maybe we should create a second lieutenant, governor, uh, lieutenant uh, general commission, and let's point, appoint Sherman, and maybe Sherman should take over for Grant. And, and it, it never went far. It was just some rumors and stuff like that. But Sherman heard about it. And the first thing he did is he wrote a letter to Grant saying, I don't know if you've heard these rumors that some people want to make me lieutenant general. I just want you to know that uh, I will not accept any commission that would create a rivalry between you and me. I am more than happy and I'm thankful that I can serve under you. Uh, and so then Grant writes him back. He says, oh, hey, no problem. If they want to put you in charge, I will be thankful and happy to serve under you. And, you know, I, I think there's a pretty good chance Grant meant it. I mean, he would have, I mean, he would have had to swallow his pride, but both of them really were very much focused on doing what was best for the Union to win. Um, and I don't think Sherman would ever have written that letter if he didn't have that trust and confidence in Grant uh, to begin with. And then uh, at some point, Meade was being criticized. You know, the Army of the Potomac wasn't defeating Lee and all of that. Um, somebody uh, had uh, 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 nominated him to be a major general in the regular army. He was a major general in the volunteers. Uh, and se the Senate wouldn't act on it. And, and Meade was, you know, sensitive. And so Meade was getting really angry that, um, that the Senate was not uh, uh, confirming him as a major general in the regulars. Grant wrote a letter that uh, 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 actually he wrote it to um, uh, uh, Sherman, uh, and, no, Washburn, the Congressman Washburn, kind of his mentor. And he said, Meade has done everything humanly possible uh, as commander of the Army of the Potomac. People don't realize the challenges he faces and the difficulty of this task, but Meade has done everything that we could ask for as a, as a commander of the Army of the Potomac, and he deserves to be a major general in the regular army. And a week later, the Senate uh, confirmed him. Now, of course, we know that Meade, uh, that Grant would sometimes get a little frustrated with Meade, and we also know, Kenton shows this, that when it really came to certain types of assignments, Grant would not give it to Meade. He would give it to Sheridan, right? Because he had more confidence in Sheridan's speed rather than Meade uh, being a little bit slower. But he still had a lot of respect and appreciation for, uh, for Meade. And then finally, to me, this is almost like the essence of, of real leadership. Um, uh, when he was uh, in, uh, uh, heading down to Vicksburg, Grant saw you know, that there was this big problem with uh, escaping slaves, right? And what are we going to do with, with the slaves? And so he met a chaplain uh, from one of the regiments, uh, Chaplain Eaton. And he had a couple conversations with Eaton, and he was impressed with him. And so he sent an order to Eaton saying, I am putting you in charge of dealing with all of the escaped slaves that are now following the army. Um, and Eaton went to see him and said, General, I have no uh, experience with this. There's no way that you know, I could you know, be successful in this. And, and, and Grant says to him, Eaton, I am going to have you report directly to me, and I will take care of you. And he did. 
He gave Eaton everything that he needed. Grant educated himself on the issue, and Eaton was very successful in helping improve the situation. And, and so this idea of a leader saying, yeah, I'm going to ask you to do something, but I'm also going to have your back. I'm going to take care of you. I, I think that's a crucial thing uh, uh, in, in leadership. And, and, and another example of this is, is a, a letter that Sherman wrote, wrote to Grant. I knew that wherever I was that you thought of me, and if I got in a tight place, you would come if alive. Right? So Sherman knew that Grant had his back that he wouldn't make him a scapegoat. He wouldn't let him hang out to dry. And as far as, you know, uh, you know in military uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, practice, there's this very important concept called unit cohesion, right? Best example of that is, uh, you know, Chamberlain and the 20th Maine, the unit cohesion that they had at Little Round Trap. They act in concert. They communicate. They act as one unit, right? Um, Grant understood that at the command level. He kn knew the importance of command cohesion. And in the West, that's what he had with Sherman, with McPherson. Once he got rid of McClellan, right? McClellan was the problem, right? He wouldn't be a team player. But Grant insisted that all of his top commanders be team players and work together. No rivalry, no backstabbing, no hesitation to help somebody else to make them look good. Grant really valued that, and he insisted on that uh, uh, in his command of the Western armies. Um, but now we get to Grant as general-in-chief, and now he has to deal with the Army of the Potomac, and he has to deal with Washington, right? The politics of Washington, D.C. And Canton really emphasizes this. Canton really thought there were two serious problems with the Army of the Potomac, uh, and this you know, won't come as a shock uh, to too many people. One is that it was so political, and there was so much rivalry between the top echelon of commanders. And Canton says, you know, it's probably because they were so close to Washington, D.C., uh, that they were so close to the politics. And there was, of course, a lot of political generals that were appointed um, in the Army of the Potomac. And, and in a way, you could say early on with McClellan, you know, who was a very, very much a political player, it kind of became the culture of the command structure of the Army of the Potomac to have all this bickering and rivalry and jealousy and, and political maneuvering. Uh, and of course, that is not good for command cohesion. Uh, the second problem that Canton uh, 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 felt that uh, Grant had to deal with was a kind of sluggishness on the commanders that they were overly cautious. They weren't fast. They weren't eager for battle. Now, maybe that's because you know, they had suffered a lot <laughs> at Lee, by Lee and Longstreet and, and uh, Stonewall Jackson. But of course, in the West, what was so important to, to Grant's success was the fact that he knew that his commanders would act on a dime. They would get there as fast as they could. Um, and this was a real problem. And it really influenced Grant's strategy. You know, he had come up with a, a, a much more uh, kind of bold strategy against Lee, but he felt it, it was too risky. Uh, in part because he still had to protect Washington, D.C. Uh, and second, he didn't have the full confidence of the commanders, not the soldiers, but the commanders of, of the Army of the Potomac. Um, and so he had to figure out how to whip the Army of the Potomac into enough command cohesion and speed and eagerness uh, to beat Lee. And eventually he did. But Canton really says it's only like it was like one step forward, two steps back. The, you know, uh, Canton describes the wilderness as a complete and utter failure of the upper echelon command, that nobody in the command uh, uh, beneath Meade did their job that day, that they all made awful mistakes. Um, uh, so, uh, so that is, are the two things that, that Grant had uh, to deal with within the Army of the Potomac. And, and one example of how he started to make progress is that early on, uh, the quartermaster general of the Army of the Potomac, a fellow named General Rufus Engels, um, met with Grant. Grant said, I need to talk to you, Engels. And they had a conversation about what Grant expected. And so after the meeting, uh, Engels goes to Meade. And he says, I tell you, Meade, Grant means business. <laughs> All right. So that kind of so shows that early on, Grant started to set the tone. But of course, 
not everyone responded as well as Ingalls. And it took time for some to really get with the program. And some never did, right? Some were ultimately you know, relieved of duty or transferred because Grant just felt he couldn't win with them in command. And so this is, I think, an, another, and, and this is sort of my final uh, point about uh, the greatness that Canton shows in Grant. Grant was successful in the West under the circumstances of the West, the geographic problems, the logistic problems, all of that, right? And then he goes east to the Army of the Potomac, a completely, completely different situation. And guess what? Grant figured it out, and he had incredible success being the de facto commander of the Army of the Potomac. And then finally, as general in chief, he had to deal with Washington, right? DC. He had to deal with Stanton. He had to deal with Halleck. He had to deal with all the political maneuvering within the government itself and the War Department. And guess what? He figured that out too. He was incredibly savvy, knowing when to push his agenda, when to hold back, when to talk to Lincoln. And of course, Lincoln had his back. I mean, a big part of that was the relationship that Lincoln and, and, and Grant had. And, and so, you know, up until Grant coming as uh, commander, as, as general in chief, there would always be these controversies. You know, some general's, you know, pride or, or ego got hurt and he wanted, you know, uh, retribution against some other general. And all of this stuff would ultimately get to Stanton and Lincoln and they would have to somehow deal with it even though they were not really competent to deal with it and Lincoln knew that Lincoln said you know I, I wish I didn't have to deal with this stuff because this really isn't my you know my my uh, my strength and so when Grant finally got there and started to set things straight and work things out uh, one day Lincoln goes up to Stanton and says you know Stanton uh, uh, Grant, he's relieved us of duty, right? He, in a way, we're no longer in charge of all of that political mess because Grant's going to take care of it now. So it's like, Grant is like, okay, Stanton and Lincoln, you had to deal with it before, but now I'm here and I'm going to be able to, to take care of it. Um, and that's what he did. So that is my interpretation of Canton's interpretation of uh, Ulysses S. Grant's uh, greatness as a general. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk to them. Anybody want to challenge me on anything or, or uh, raise any other interesting points? Yeah. Did Cam have any specific uh, notions or ideas about um, Grant's performance in the wilderness? Because in Grant's memoirs, he regretted most of uh, the loss of life and that was the source of a lot of criticism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I just touched upon it briefly, and there's obviously a lot more there. But Canton's basic take is that it was at the, you know, the, the core and division command level that were the real problems in the wilderness. Uh, now, you could argue that, therefore, Grant shouldn't have gone in to begin with, right? Um, uh, and so that you know, is a debate. But, but Grant, you know, Canton does not present Grant as regretting that because it was serving a, a, a higher strategic purpose in the context of the overall strategy of pinning Lee down so that Sherman and everybody else. Although that's too great a cost to achieve the, the level that it Yeah, well I think Grant would say it actually gained a lot. If you look at the big picture, it gained a lot. And this is what Kenton says, people only look at what was happening in Virginia. And in that perspective, you could say, yeah, that was a lot uh, to lose you know, for the sake of some gain, right? But if you look at what that meant, because that meant Lee could not, you know, you knew otherwise, Lee would have sent troops to help Joe Johnston against Sherman. But he couldn't, because Grant was unrelenting pressure. Um, also, Canton makes the point, and actually other military historians have made the point that, you know, from a percentage standpoint, um, Lee actually lost more men than Grant over the course of the war. Uh, and that the, um, the uh, uh, idea of a, of a war of attrition, Canton totally rejects. He says that was not what Grant was doing, even though that's often what it's interpreted by. But, Grant, but Canton would say, you're not looking closely and carefully enough at what Grant was doing. And so what Canton tries to do is lay out everything that Grant was doing 
to reply to those critics. Uh, of course, whether Canton is right or not would have to have a lot longer uh, investigation and discussion, but that, that is obviously a really big issue and, and, and a great question to really think about. Yes? I think Grant was smart enough not to stay in Washington, D.C. and to go out with the Army of the Potomac number one. Yeah. Because um, Henry Halleck had just become a paper pusher by that yeah. time. And yeah. His advice used to be to everybody, what do you think is better? <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. He was great at avoiding responsibility. Uh, yeah. I do have a different viewpoint when you said that nothing became of uh, when the victories at Fort Knox. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because with the Anaconda plan, that was part of the plan. Take the Tennessee River, yeah. take the Cumberland River, and now you just cleaned out the Confederate troops yeah. from Kentucky, yeah. which was a very important state, and down into Tennessee. Yeah. So now yeah. at Shiloh, you've got Johnston coming up and surprising Grant on the first day, but he was waiting for Buell's army of the Ohio to come in, and then they uh, day two, as we know, yeah. you know, they had a hell of a day. Yeah, yeah I, I actually, yeah. So I actually basically agree with you, and, and in a way, I, I could have said it better. When I said nothing happened, what I really mean is missed opportunities, right? That was Grant's frustration, that if they had acted immediately after those victories, they could have even have gotten more benefit and ended the war sooner. They would have advanced that strategy with kind of some modification, because we know that kind of evolved over time. They would have better served that strategy if they had kept on moving and kept putting pressure on. So it was more a question of lost opportunity. Obviously, there was great benefits from every one of those victories, but Grant was just frustrated that they were missing an opportunity to even have more advantage. But they wanted Shiloh, and then Alec took over. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Your mind had over 100,000 men. Right. It took him like 50 days to go 20 miles right. to get right. to Right. If Grant had stayed in charge, he would have been in Corinth well, within two weeks. Yeah. Anybody. Yeah. In two weeks, he would have been there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah that's, that's kind of the point. Yeah. Joe. Did he go into the meeting, of the famous meeting in 1864 uh, on the River Queen, Chairman Grant? And I forgot, was it Dixon Porter, was the admiral, who uh, was at the meeting? And that's where they came up with the unified yeah. strategy. One of the right. Most important yeah. Yeah. And that was the total war strategy. Right. Right. Uh, where Lincoln recognized it as being pretty much what he had thought from the beginning. Yep. Uh, those about skinning can hold the leg. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And that's really where the total war that you saw yeah. shortly thereafter there was the mass right. cross Yeah. And, uh, um, the conversion to total warfare, which to me at least anyway, was a recognition of the center of gravity in the Confederacy was the Arms, yeah. not. The, um, the Not the cities, right? The yeah. City, yeah. Okay, exactly. Capture the enemy's capital right. in the game. Right. Uh, Lincoln recognized that early, uh, and that's why one of the reasons he was so disappointed with Lee not pursuing yeah. Uh, yeah. Lee with a great deal of vigor was because Lee, you know, we've driven the enemy from our. You know, right. they're not you know, they're not here to defend our borders. Right. We're here right. to destroy that enemy. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't do it, and yeah. that was the famous letter we never sent to Lee. But right. I'm wondering if that's yeah. Yeah, so Catton gets into that and, and uses that to illustrate this whole point. So going back to what Grant said in his, his memoirs about after Shiloh, complete conquest, right? And then the question is, how do you achieve that? And he said, you, you, you have to destroy the armies, but that also means you have to destroy everything that supports the armies. Right, and that's the idea of Sherman, you know, going through the West uh, um, uh, uh, to Atlanta and then uh, to the sea, the march to the sea. Um, so yeah, so so that that's where it all coalesced because I think you're right. Lincoln had figured this out, but of course he didn't have the wherewithal to implement it from a military standpoint, right? Um, but he understood the concepts and what was necessary. And then when he met, found Grant, he's like. Finally, here's a guy that has the military know-how and understands the strategy so he can make it happen. And that's why you know, he kind of, you know, Lincoln kind of jokingly said to Stanton, we've been relieved. <laughs> we don't have to make believe we're generals anymore because now we have Grant, who is a real general, and he's, he's going to take care of us, right? He's going to do what it takes to, to win. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.